I'm very happy that you have joined us for this yet another virtual where we continue to bring to light all the bad things that happen in the darkness and um, we report to you every week and sometimes more than once during the week. So we've seen throughout the past week that we've gone through um, last week, a lot of very important discussions and debates took place. I intend to address some of the shortcomings of uh, procedures being employed by the government in effect to shut us down, to mute us as it did in the parliament itself, but they will not stop us, we will continue. They are on the back foot, you know. They are on the back foot. Because never before have we had the kind of oppression that we are experiencing under this dictator government. I say again, do not be troubled. We have them on the back foot. Everywhere in the country, under this rowly dictatorship, there are problems in every sector of the country. One, in the health sector, for sure, and I'll talk more about that. With respect to crime, respect to education, with respect to the cost of living, the price of groceries, everything is in shambles. And do not even begin to think or speak about the deterioration of our infrastructure. I have said we are no longer just a banana republic. We are now a pothole republic. More potholes than roads. And in the meantime, they are living like kings and queens. They still believe we are in that colonial era and they are the successors to the colonial masters. So what we have been seeing, the president, imagine, is having some lavish banquet in a time of COVID when so many others cannot just put a meal on the table. When everyone else has been asked to lock down and shut down and do not gather, I saw some kind of uh, something out on the social media where the president is hosting this banquet again. They are there collecting their million dollar rents. They're going on golfing trips whilst they are figuratively and literally knocking down everybody in the way. And these are our citizens who are struggling with COVID and the economic downturn of our country. Despite the state of emergency, however, I have seen people rising up across the country because enough is enough. They have run roughshod, as I say, figuratively on a golf cart, bong song somebody, just running roughshod and people are, they can't take it anymore. The oppression is too much. They just can't take it anymore. I remind you, we in the UNC, we have stood with you. We have stood with you inside the parliament and outside the parliament. And again, I say the PNM is on the back foot. They don't know how to respond. And I tell you, we are not afraid. We will not be easily pushed over. We will continue to fight for you. Let's look at the state of our country under Rowley's dictatorship. When we look at where we are today, the state of our nation under the dictatorship, we see a nation besieged. We see a nation in crisis and we see people everywhere experiencing suffering. And this is partly because all they care about is their own personal profits. That's one reason why. But another reason is because they are so incompetent they just cannot govern. It is mismanagement, corruption, and of course, taking care of their own. I want you to remember, members of this cabinet, members of this rowley dictatorship, they have recused themselves over 210 times, not once, not twice, 210 times more and counting. Why? Because friends and families can gain from government contracts. I ask, does it sound like a government who cares about you? Or is it one that cares only about themselves, their friends, their family, and their finances? Dictator Rowley keeps taking away the rights of the opposition in Parliament. And they take away your rights too, to equal treatment, your right to seek judicial review, your right to criticize the government, your rights to privacy, your rights to freely enjoy your property, your rights to freely assemble, and above all, your rights to freedom of expression. The pandemic has been used as an excuse by Dictator Rowley to keep violating your rights. Now people's incomes and savings have been drained. Drained. Criminals are on the rampage. The price of basic foodstuffs, those prices have skyrocketed. Water and roads are worsening every day. More and more people are falling into poverty and more and more businesses are closing. The dictatorship has failed in every aspect of governments. Governance. And can I remind you, they have spent over $304 billion during their terms in office the first and now in the second. 
and yet they have nothing to show for it. Absolutely nothing. They took it all for themselves. Again, I talk about their friends, their family, and their finances. Nothing works. At the same time, Dictator Rowley has ordered NGC to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in train one, when the shareholders, the external shareholders, owning 90% of the company, they refused and told the government from day one since last year, there is not enough gas to sustain the train one. The government foolishly launched in, took your taxpayers' dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to sink into train one, and then they want to give an indemnity to the wrongdoers who caused you to lose all this money. They want to take away your rights, I said before. They want to take our rights as your representatives in the parliament. So we mustn't question them. We must not call them to account as to how they're spending your money. But we will not stop. And whilst uh, Dictator Rowley may believe he has a get out of jail free card, they don't want, they want you. What do they want you to do? Pay more taxes on your property. Pay more for gas. And they will stop spending on our children's education, our infrastructure and health. In the meantime, they keep taking from the treasury, recusing themselves and granting themselves tax breaks, but you have to pay taxes. This is what dictatorship is about, money, power for money's sake. And that is what the over 210 recusers are all about. I know MP Saddam had shared with you some of the details of it, but that is totally unacceptable. That the cabinet sits, is there friends sitting around the table with each other. One gets up, left foot, they go outside. Come back in. While he's outside, their friends in the cabinet approves contracts for friends, family, and financiers. Then the right foot one takes outside, same thing is happening. It is a whole club. I have called them a mafiosa. All they care about is about themselves, their friends, and their family and financiers. You know, under my watch, we had reached the top in terms of educational achievement in the region and in some cases in the world. Our infrastructure was well maintained and expanded. Our health system advanced leaps and bounds. We had, we had repaired over 125 health centers throughout the country. We had instructed that they be open for 24 hours. And never to mention, it was us. They say, what you did for Tobago? It was us who completed a state-of-the-art hospital in Scarborough. It was from us that we got the Coover Children's Hospital. It took a pandemic to open that hospital. It was under my watch that the Arima Hospital began, that the Point Fortin Hospital began. And let us not forget that state-of-the-art San Fernando Teaching Hospital. Some people say it's like a, a tourist destination. When you go upstairs on the floors, you see the ocean, you see the sea. Outside there, the Caribbean Sea. Beautiful, nice, well done. So in healthcare, we really invested heavily. We invested, in my term, very heavily in the children of this nation because we believe the children are indeed the future of any nation. So here we were. Prices were lower. People had jobs. Businesses were expanding. And I want to remind you, we did all of this without a single new tax, not one new tax. They have brought tax upon tax, and they continue. They only thought they do not know how to govern incompetence and they will not take advice from even their own advisors as to how to grow the economy. So what is their answer? Tax, 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 borrow, borrow, spend, spend. No plans whatsoever to grow the economy and to manage uh, the cost of living and the standard of living in our country. And what we did, the 50,000 new jobs we created without a single tax. And we did that during a global crisis. A Great Recession went by, worse than the Great Depression. All these things have happened. We have never been as badly off as we are now under Dictator Rowley. But we cared about you and not about ourselves. We protected you and we made sure that you and your children will continue to have a good quality of life. As I say, we didn't take away your taxes. We didn't raise your taxes. We didn't take away our fuel subsidy. We never took away your rights, never. We had the Children's Life Fund. We built a children's hospital. We gave free textbooks to children. We gave free laptops. We expanded the school feeding program. All of this has gone to waste. It's a wasteland under the Rowley dictatorship. Do you know today, under this Rowley dictatorship, about 80,000 children who need food support have been totally abandoned, even though government knows that more and more families 
are suffering from unemployment and from poverty. They have taken us from a, a, a nation enjoying a good quality of life to one, as I said before, that has now become a wasteland under this dictatorship. And whilst all of that is happening and all that suffering is taking place, we are seeing where the government, this government, this rowdy dictatorship are continuing to put their friends, their family, their financiers, or friends of their financiers and so on, into key positions. Why? To have a dictatorship, to have total control. When it is in the parliament, we were debating the uh, <clears throat> new nominees to sit as commissioners on the police service commission. That was because of one of the greatest stains in the life of our country when the entire police service, service commission collapsed. Why did it collapse? It collapsed because of interference from a high official at the level of president's house when they resigned Amas, creating all these vacancies in the police service commission. Rowley in his efforts compromised both this police service commission and the office of the president to the point sadly where they have lost credibility. The PNM are used to TNT being a nine day won the country and they think these things will go away. They used to just keep in shut up for nine days, let everybody just move on and they think you will forget their wrongdoing. It will go unpunished and uncorrected. Some may say they are getting away with murder. However, the UNC and the People's Revolution is changing that. We are not going to let these things pass. Dictator Rowley, all the recusers and the renters and the tax breaks, we are not going to let that pass. And they do not have a get out of jail free card. We will not give up. We will not stop. The Prime Minister and the President want to go back to what they consider the good old days. When after the nine days, all the noise, they feel their wrongdoing went uncorrected and unpunished. This is what they're trying to do with the Collapsed Police Service Commission. As we said in Parliament and previously, we have nothing against the persons nominated to service commissioners. Nothing. They're sons and daughters of our soil. They're distinguished persons. What we do have a problem with, we have, we have problems on two accounts. One. And I want to raise those concerns. Getting to the bottom of the interference and collapse of the previous police service commission. One, a lot of concerns. Two, ensuring that there is no apparent bias or other matter which would make the current appointments unsuitable. We do not want this present one to collapse as well, this police service commission. This is why the opposition was very specific in the constitution to ask for the vetting of nominees. I want to make a point here. I was part of the team, part of the Pande team under the Pande government, under the Pande opposition, and Mr. Manning had a team of lawyers and others, those of us as MPs and so on. And we went, Mr. Manning called upon Mr. Pande and the then opposition for us to come forward to try to find a solution to the high rates of crime affecting our country. The thinking then was that the police commissioner was a toothless bulldog. He had no powers. And therefore, something had to be done to give to the Commissioner of Police so he could manage his, his team, the TTPS, more efficiently. The second thing that was in, in those talks and was taken into consideration is that the Prime Minister, Prime Minister had a veto over the person to be appointed as Commissioner of Police. We may have forgotten this, but this is where all these things came forward. I was part of that team, I'm very proud to say, where we tried to make some changes. We were able to do some and not all. So Prime Minister's veto was the, the Police Service Commission then would send him a name. And if he didn't like that person, no. Veto, total absolute veto control. And then they'll send the next name and the next name. And in the meantime, nobody in the country knew which names were sent and which names were rejected. And we said, well, no, we can't do that. They hold such important positions because in the law, I keep talking about Endel Thomas as a locus classicus, the case which said, you cannot have the government of the day choosing the person to be a commissioner of police because then the commissioner of police and all the police will become an army, a private army of the ruling party, the majority party in the parliament. And that's one of the things we tried to correct. So we removed the veto, Prime Minister's veto, and said, look, instead, let the service commission send the names to president who will then send it to parliament for approval 
And yes, it is true the government has a built-in majority, but at least in the debates in the parliament, should there be matters that are questionable, they can be raised so the public will know which persons were sent forward. The public will know what are the concerns about persons. That was the whole thinking. It was a hybrid system between what we have in the common law and in the commonwealth and what the US does, where they actually have the nominees coming before their Congress for questioning and raising. And lo and behold, when this debate was taking place, wrongfully, the opposition was stopped from making comments about the nominees. So what's the point? Do we just go there and vote and go home? Do we just read a resume? No, a character is not just about your educational qualifications, you know. A person, a suitable person. It's about who and what you are. What are your affiliations? Do you have bias? Are you conflicted? Those were the issues. When we, when we, we created this hybrid system, those were the things that the parliament was supposed to look into, debate, and at the end of the day, take a decision. I'm saying the government will get its way. There's a saying in Commonwealth Parliament, say, let the opposition have its say, the government will have its way. But that's the job of a loyal opposition, to raise concerns, to expose wrongdoing where it may be, to bring to light what may be hidden in the darkness. And so we tried to get into that in the debate last day, but we were stopped. They say it's not a substantive motion. Well, if that is not a substantive motion, I don't know what on earth is a substantive motion. And what a substantive motion allows you to do, whether you call it or you don't call it that, but I'm telling you the context within which this whole hybrid system was created was to go into the parliament and raise questions about the nominees. That's what that is about. And this is a place, where will you do it? Yes, we'll do it outside the parliament, but it should go on a Hansard record where there are concerns about nominees. And so we tried to do that. That is why we did it. The opposition, it is the opposition to point out problems. It is more so for us than the government. And there are no independent senators in this. When we created this hybrid system, it was only to be deb debated in the House of Representatives, and not for the senators. It's for the elected representatives of the people. We will get the names, we will debate, we raise the concerns. So one month after, the Police Service Commission, led by Bliss Sipasad, collapsed. The population has yet to learn reasons why that happened in the first place. Why? Up to today, we can't find out. This is a major independent institution of the country. That Police Service Commission, when we created the new law, in the new hybrid system, we said the Police Service Commission now will only be in charge of the appointment, uh, the uh, transfer, promotions, and so on, of those on the high echelons of the police service. All the other thousands of TTPS, they will be managed by the Commission of Police and his team. So the Police Service Commission was given a very specific task to recruit and recommend for appointment the Commission of Police. That was their job. And then to monitor and vet the performance of these officials. So commissioner and deputy commissioners was within the sole purview of the police, the new police service commission. And I say new, created under the law that we had passed in that year prior to 2010. So we are yet to hear who was the high-ranking official who intercepted the merit list at President's House. And these are very serious concerns. But we also find that some of the names that they put forward, the nominees, have serious conflicts of interest, bias, apparent bias, and in some cases, direct bias, and therefore are unfit to serve on such an important commission. One such person is Maxine King. Let me share some of this with you, which we tried to raise in the parliament, and we get, they kept trying to shut us up. But what's out in the darkness will come to the light, and we will share it with you. Maxine King is a wealth manager at a company called First Line Securities. It has now come to light that First Line Securities is a collateral agent in the development of the Bacolay estate in Tobago, and they are jointly so with a company called Inez Investments. Inez Investments is run by Mr. Alan Warner. He just happens to be the longtime business partner of Keith Rowley. Long time business partner. They were both, he, Rowley was one of two directors. Alan Warner was the other director of um, a company called Alma Farms. I think it became Alma Farms thereafter. But initially, it was under a different name. It's called Alma River Ventures. Rowley was a business partner, just two of them. 
Alan Warner and Keith Christopher Rowling of Alma River Ventures. That has since converted into something called Alma Farm Limited, a new name. New name. So they have a roots and ties, business partners going way back when. Way back. Rowley was removed from the company. And when he was removed, a gentleman, gentleman by the name of Mr. Townsend became the second director in place of Rowley in this Warner Investments. And I want you to keep that name because there's more to come. More to come. Townsend replaced Rowley. But you will find Townsend appearing in many other companies. And we'll talk a little more about that. So Keith Rowley, Alan Warner were the only directors of Alma River Ventures. Now this is the same Warner, Tobago Warner, of Warner Construction, of the Landate fame, infamy, whatever you want to call it. This is the same name with respect to the ties with Mr. Rowley um, in Landate. Warner Construction has now become a mega contractor between 2015 to present under the Rowley government. So, in putting forward this name, did Her Excellency expect the country to believe that in selecting a suitably qualified person, this is Maxine King, and these persons will now have to choose who is the next commissioner, did she just coincidentally select someone with such close ties to Rowley and his longtime business partner, Alan Warner? This is Maxine King. Her Excellency must explain the criteria and justification for selecting Maxine King, Maxine King to sit on the Police Service Commission. The opposition maintains, given the President's unwillingness to answer questions, serious questions, over alleged political interference leading to the collapse of the Police Service Commission, Excellency must not proceed further until we can build that public, public trust, restore public trust. So that's a serious concern we have. Our independent institutions are under attack from this Rowley dictatorship. And to the unbiased observer, this attack seems to be sided, aided and abetted by the office of the president, none other than the office of the president. So two of the highest officers in the land have serious questions, the office of the president and the prime minister. So we will go forward because now we have concerns now about the speaker of the house. Was the speaker complicit in her rulings when we were debating the nominees for the service commission? Was she complicit in hiding and preventing Matters of grave concern being raised in that parliament. I say to the speaker, last week, the opposition attempted to raise questions when we were debating the nominees about several of the nominees, but I come back again to Maxine King, about connections between Maxine King to Rowley's best friend and business partner, partner Alan Warner. The speaker prevented Dr. Monilal from speaking about Alan Warner's development called Inez Investments. So Inez is a very popular name for Mr. Warner because I, that Mr. Warner from Tobago, I understand it may have been a close relative of his. So he has several companies named after it. And I'll show you something. Whoops. <laughs> we have a file, Mr. Warner, and I'm putting you on notice. We do have a file. I can't go into all of this today but we will go into all of it in due course. Miss Allen Warner, you know what happens in the dark will come to light. So we do have this file from Mr. Warner. Thank you. And here we are now. The speaker prevented Dr. Monila from speaking about his development called Inez Investments. I want to ask the speaker of the house, did you willfully prevent Dr. Munial from speaking about Allen Warner and Inez Investments? because you are conflicted. Does your husband, Newman George, have a million dollar townhouse in Warner's development known as Inez Gate? Is Mr. Warner the favorite contractor and designated real estate provider for the p &M hierarchy? I ask again, honorary speaker, why did you stop the opposition from raising serious concerns which we are entitled to about your nominees or about the president's nominees in the parliament. I ask again, does your husband, Newman George, own a townhouse in Inez Gate, it's called. That company is called Inez Gate. Can you imagine? What an irony, Inez Gate. This is a folder 
on INS Gate, which I'll share with you, not today, but in due course. What's happening in the dark will come to light. So this is the folder, and I put you on warning. And do not go in the company's registry or in the land's registry to delete any records, because we already have screenshots of all those records. I will speak to you more about this. So we have uh, Alan Warner, we have INS Gate, very thick folder, I will share with you. So Madam Speaker, again I ask, does your husband, Newman George, own a million dollar tongue, more than a million dollars, in Warner's development, INS Gate in Tobago? And is Alan Warner the favored contractor and designated real estate provider for the PM hierarchy? So I'm asking today, tonight, and I'm asking uh, Mr. Archie and Mr. Kivan to show you some photos. These photos show 46 townhouses in Shervan in Tobago. They are, many people own them. Mr. Rowley, I'm putting you on notice too. This is your file. I'm putting you on notice as well, Mr. Rowley. And many others with respect to Ines Gate, okay? So there are the photos on the screen and um, of the townhouses and I'll speak to you more about them. In the meantime, our question goes to the speaker of the house. And madam, did you declare it in your integrity forms? Tell us, did you declare the ownership of your spouse, Mr. Newman George, in one of these townhouses that we are showing up on the screen? Did you declare that to the integrity commission? And we'll find out, you know, if we have not already done so. I'm sure we will know because the form B, and this is where the attorney general fell into error when we were speaking last time, saying we disclosed um, somebody leaked. That wasn't leaked. Every public official, your Form B can be examined by members of the public. And we have done so with many of these officials and we'll share the searches with you. So here we are. Alan Warner of landed, notari landed fame has become a mega contractor, as I told you. Alan Warner and Keith Rowley have many questions to answer. I have a lot more information regarding Warner and other contracts and business dealings under the Rowley government over the last six years and in the coming days we will deal with it. I also want to put a notice, another friend of Keith Rowley, his name is Thackeray. This is another of the Prime Minister's best friends. He seemed to have quite a few of those. I will deal with Thackeray on another day. In the meantime, he should stop complaining and continue building and breaking and rebuilding barbecue pits and goat pens for his best friend Keith Rowley. So Mr. Thackeray, this is a file we have on you too. What happens in the dark will come to light. So they all have very serious questions to answer and we will continue to expose them in the days and weeks to come. My colleagues um, have been speaking and uh, I'm sure they will continue to speak on the failed COVID propaganda team. I will just add to their words to say, you know, it is really a horrendous state of affairs and a place to be. And just because of the mismanagement of the Rowley dictatorship and their failed propaganda team, that we are in the situation we are today. But I, I, my colleagues will deal with that. And um, I want to talk a bit about the ending of the SOE. On Saturday, the Prime Minister, at his weekly buffing session, Dictator Rowley, he blamed the citizens of our country for the rising COVID inf infections. So according to Dictator Rowley and PNM Logic, when infections are low, the country should play, praise him, applaud him. But when infections are high, guess what? Blame the public, blame people out there and not them. What about when he got infected? Who is he blaming for that? He has nothing but contempt for the people of our country suffering under the pandemic and made worse by his incompetent, perhaps even some may say criminal mishandling of the pandemic. Now, Dictator Rowley says, the government will be coming to Parliament to end SOE on Wednesday the 17th, two weeks before the date it is set to expire. I want to say to you, Mr. Rowling, ending the SOE is not some kind of gift you're giving to the people of our country. Stop demanding people thank you for giving them the freedoms that you took away, freedoms that were rightfully theirs, they do not belong to you. 
Dictator Rowley knows we in the opposition were never going to support his continued trampling of individual rights and freedoms. There was absolutely no justification so to do. And therefore, when you come to Parliament on Wednesday, you better come and tell us how this SOE helped to deal with the situation that you described. You talked about trying to contain COVID, but instead what happened? The numbers went up. You talk about using the SOE for vaccinations. Did that happen? You have to account to the population. Don't just come and say, clap me. You know, look, I'm giving you back. I'm taking away the SOE before time. And tell us the truth. The reason you're removing the SOE is why? You want to campaign in Tobago. That's what this is about. It's a political tool. You're using this SOE as a political tool. With two weeks to go, I'm saying the only reason he wants to lift it is so he could campaign in Tobago. And guess what? He knows they are in trouble in Tobago. The polling is showing that they are in trouble in the, for the elections coming up in Tobago. And so take away SOE, go tramperize, do everything, anything. You did it before. Remember the Easter when he opened up the country? Everybody come to Tobago, man. Come. What do you care? You do not care. It certainly can't be for anything else. This early removal of the SOE. Just a couple of days to go, it would have expired on its own. Where is the science in your decision? Come and tell us. Where is the science in the decision? You talk all the time, you're gui guided by the science. You insist that your government is following the science and dealing with COVID. How does this make any sense? You don't care about ending COVID and saving lives and livelihoods. What you do care about now is saving your own skin from a cut tail in Tobago. He knows the people of Tobago are fed up with him. In the last THE election, Mason Hall kicked out Rowley and the PNM. This time, all of Tobago may well kick out dictator Rowley and the PNM. Come Wednesday in Parliament, we will expose Rowley's failed SOE for what it is. So it's a serious matter. This is not to be taken lightly. Come and tell us how this SOE over all this time, all these lockdowns, what benefit did you get? Because I can see none. And therefore, do not come looking for gratitude because you're now deciding to remove this state of emergency and the curtailment of all rights and freedoms of citizens. Just for a moment, I will speak about Imbert's Revenue Authority. I know my colleagues have spoken. I just want to endorse what they've said. And to make it very clear, this uh, Revenue Authority that they're setting, trying to set up, the TTRA, we debated last day in Parliament. We shared our views. I know my colleagues over the weekend shared their views on it. It is totally unconstitutional. It is an assault on the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. It is an assault on the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And we do not support it. Now, strangely enough, in Parliament last day, we are debating this, and they just shut down the debate. After I had spoken, and, and, and the AG came with all his lies as usual, and sound and fury, and with no substance, and Saddam responded, in the middle of the contribution of um, Mr. Brian Manning, he was like, taken aback, he was reading, and in the middle of a sentence, they got up and adjourned the Parliament. Why? because they knew we were not going to support it, because they know it is wrong. I think they do know it is very, very wrong. It is a total breach of the Constitution, and not just the Section 4 and 5 human rights. It is in breach of the entire structure of our Constitution. And therefore, it doesn't just require three-fifths. That may very well be legislation requiring two-thirds or three-quarters, because you're tampering. A serious, is a fundamental change to the structure of governance to the structure of the constitution and to the structuring and workings of a democracy to which we subscribe. So we'll have another day, they will have another day, but at the end of the day it will be the courts of Trinidad and Tobago who will decide on this TTRE. And one of the things they're pushing this so hard, I know um, last Wednesday when they said the House is now adjourned to Friday and we'll be dealing with the TTRE, Mr. Emmett said, yes, let's get this over it. I looked at him and I said, Minister, You'll get it out of here, but it will go to the courthouse. It is not going to stand up in a court of law. So I serve you notice on that again. And as I close here tonight, I want to thank you all again for joining us. It's always nice talking with you. We get that energy from you, even though it's through the cameras. But sometimes I can feel the spirituality and the energy through the camera. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your support. We in the UNC, our great party, we thank you. And we commit to you in the face of this dictatorship, this destruction of our economy, destruction of livelihoods, destruction of lives, destruction of rights and freedoms, destruction of our country all across the nation. We continue to see the vast number of persons 
who have taken to the streets to fight for their democratic rights and for our republic. Persons have taken to the streets after this dictator Rowley has failed to deliver on the most basic responsibilities of a government. Imagine in this year 2021, citizens must protest for pipe-borne water or for a simple passable road. But I tell you and I commit, the people's revolution will continue until good governance and democracy are rebuilt and restored to our great nation. In this regard, we continue with the People's Revolution activities throughout the country. And I want to ask you to join us on 12th Sunday, 12th December, for a People's Revolution rally. We look forward to all of us joining hands together, voices together, hands and feet together, because we must fight this dictatorship. We must overcome, and we will. I thank you, and God bless you all. God bless Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much.